Welcome back, everybody, to episode 55 of the Sports Medicine Project. Now, before we get started, we have a huge thank you for all the listeners. And if you follow us on Instagram, you would have seen this week the Spotify Wrapped came out and our podcast, you wouldn't read about it. Top 10% in the world, top 10% downloaded, which is awesome. And it's an obvious thank you to to all our incredibly smart, good-looking, great listeners. Mm. That's awesome. You sent that to me on the weekend and I thought you had um, made it up. Yeah, that's how unreal we thought it was. It's, yeah, it was great. Now, some, I guess, nuance to it. There's lots of podcasts in the world. I mean, top 1% would be awesome, but it's not... I don't know. It's From what I have read and what I've talked to other podcasters, it's pretty awesome, but it's not like there's... The top ten percent isn't incredible. Like if you top was it ten percent? It was ten percent like, health and fitness. Oh no! So that was so top ten percent downloaded, listened to in the whole entire world. Out yeah. of how many people in the world? Seven billion or something like that. Thank you guys. That's so cool. And then we were in the charts before we went to New Zealand in the top fifty of health and medicine. That's cool. which is awesome. Now we didn't re- release an episode last week because you went away. You're mm-hmm. off partying up at a festival while I'm slogging away down here working on the <laughs> on the content. No, but we didn't release an episode because we like this dialogue. I enjoy this dialogue at the start of every episode, but today's oh, episode... Could you not? You couldn't do it without me. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, you know, I think I was, I was a blind spot of mine. I think you're the true star of the podcast and people don't <laughs> want to hear me talk to myself. <laughs> I'm not so, so sure about that. I did actually do... I don't know if I ever told you this. I did do a podcast. It would have been weeks ago. You were away or you were somewhere. I did a podcast myself for like 10 minutes and it was like I was talking to myself and I was like, this is pretty funny. And then I listened back to it and it was so cringy. It was horrible. So I'm so glad I didn't release that. That's funny. Yeah, But to, today's episode That's is... That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> today's episode is part one with Sam Turner and his Instagram handle, which some of you may know is the football podiatrist now it's just myself and sam kelly as much as she loves the podcast did not want to talk too much about everything football boot it's really (laughs) podiatry specific however if you're a podiatrist listening to this or anyone that deals with football as soccer as anyone that wears football boots there is so much so sorry so much there's lots of good information in here and it's not that i didn't want to talk about it it's that i would have sat there very silently because i would have had no contribution at all yeah well that conversation that's really how how i felt it was he's so knowledgeable and we were talking about off air we know so much about running shoes and we know about the characteristics recommendations and podiatrists see that all the time but football boots not that much and there's a lot to know and lots there's lots of, of people that play field-based sports that need football boot recommendations, yeah. I would assume, from yeah. a podiatrist, right? Yeah, and we talk about sex-specific football boots as oh, well. interesting. The two biggest learnings I got were, and we've ordered one in the clinic, so thanks, Sam, is you can get this thing called a spot stretcher. So it's basically a tool that you can put into the football boot, and you can it's like a little circle and a, a little ball that goes into the circle, and you can spot stretch particular parts of the boot so someone's got a bunion a toe deformity anything abnormal within their foot shouldn't say abnormal anything that is abnormal in comparison to what the footwear companies would call abnormal you can stretch it so in my case i've got like a little tailor's bunion so my fifth Mm. mpj it's a little bit prominent on that side so i could stretch it on the boot so it doesn't rub i feel like that's so necessary because footy boots just in general are so yeah. narrow aren't yeah. they like- yeah and then they're made to be and for for a lot of podiatrists that deal with and the common scenario that i work with football boots the most you know we, we see some of the, the elite players here in newcastle but way more i'm dealing with football boots in kids and kids with severs is the most where i'm dealing with and we're trying to fit you know soft inner soles and heel lifts and compression and things and maybe we can spot stretch the little heel counters yeah be awesome. We actually, I haven't seen a case it's because footy season's obviously finished, but I haven't seen a case since I've had it. But I'm keen. I'm keen. What are you yeah. smiling about? <laughs> Your eyes are just so big and excited. Because it's cool. <laughs> it's like, awesome. this is why I love talking to people because you just, I mean, oh, can you imagine? This is what I imagine when I go to sleep every night. This, that little nugget of information that you, like, you don't even know you don't know. There might be, oh, what, 400 podiatrists that, that might go, great, that's pretty cool. 100 podiatrists might get it and then 50 podiatrists might use it with four patients each. That's 200 patients a year who will be now hopefully pain-free. 
because of some conversation that I had with Sam. <clears throat> That's cool. That is cool. It is really, really cool. But it's awesome. It's awesome. And this is part one, part two, obviously, next week. But let's get to the more important stuff. Highs and lows. And new segment, reflection. And a couple of little topics I want to get your opinion on. Some things I heard this week from a quite a prominent podcast and some of the claims that they were were make not claims just a couple of things they said in passing which I wanted to get your opinion on okay is there a question no <laughs> so do you want to well, you want to start I'll with start. your highs and lows yeah, yeah. yeah you, you go first well <laughs> as usual I have no lows <sighs> all right everything's great in your life no, no I just can never think about them mm. I, I guess I suffered like a five-day hangover <laughs> I just can't bounce back anymore. But that's not very clinically yeah, re- relevant. Getting old. That's not relevant. We're clinical. We live and breathe clinics, <laughs> patients. Okay. My highs. I've got three of them. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess they're highs slash learnings slash things I found interesting. Mm, mm. Number one, we played bat ball the last two days. And it just really made me appreciate the value in multidirectional stress. Mm. I could feel yeah, my perineals getting tired by the end of it because I just know that they don't have to do anything really yeah. in my sport. Well, they do. That's a lie. But they're not loaded in the same way that they are during a game of bat ball. And my perineals were like fatiguing. I could, They were getting quite tired. Mm. And it just it's challenged me in a completely different way. And it was really fun and enjoyable. And it yeah, I, I almost just want to prescribe a multi-directional sport playing activity to to certain people because i think they're just it just really made me appreciate the the value of it yeah i well i played last week and we played for an hour and i was sore for a couple of days my adductors and just those those quad muscles i did want to add one point and i thought this was really interesting and i hope he doesn't mind me saying this and i hope he's going to come on the podcast soon matthew clark down at spark who works uh, with Nitta, really knowledgeable weapon podiatrist, sees lots of runners and coaches lots of runners. And he was talking about, because we we're talking just on, on Instagram about early specialization in mm-hmm. some of the runners that he coaches. And I, I'm sure, don't quote me on this, I'm sure he coaches the under 18s. And he was saying that, and we we're talking about how early specialization, the research is saying that it can be somewhat protective against injury. He was saying- Early specialization. Sorry, not specialising early can be protective against injury yes. in the sense of not just doing one that, sport. I think that's life. well researched. Yeah. Yeah. So he was saying that for the runners, because obviously they're doing lots and lots of running in high volume and we're talking about the, the pros and cons of sacrificing a running session to go and play sport with maybe it preventing an injury in the future but not knowing. But he, as a warm-up, gets them to like, just like kick the football and play and do that kind of lateral movement. And I thought that was really, really cool. And it's obviously being implemented, but you just never hear it at that elite, really good level. So I thought that was really cool. I think so. Um, Like even even if it's just on... Like, you know, I know some people do double run days, so maybe for, for younger athletes in particular, maybe that second run of the day should be going down going down to a field and playing a different type of sport or a tennis or bat ball or whatever. I think that would be cool. It has to be gamified. Like I'm trying to see where I can put this into the clinic, like how I can prescribe that. And I don't know if I can say go and play basketball. Like it, it has to be, be gamified somehow for the patients that I'm seeing. What do you mean? Why is going down and playing basketball not gamified? Do you mean by making it a like game? Like I'm saying, like if if I'm seeing parents and, and kids, which we both often do, and talking about how you know it's great that they're doing a sport and getting to that elite level, and you don't obviously don't have to follow that advice, but as you get better, I guess the less you probably want to do it, but trying to get them to buy into the fact mm. of because you're basically saying to them, hey, you know, your child has this injury. And the research is telling us that they should try and do as much as they possibly can. But they're trying to be a really, really elite runner or a really, mm. really elite water polo player. So just trying to, how do you get them to buy in to have, have their child and then be like, oh, all right, they need to do other sport. I, I think, guess were we tricky. talking about this last last podcast? No. I'm pretty sure we were talking about something pretty similar. No way. Because, yeah, we were. Because I, I remember I said, how much is enough? Like, do you think PE at school is enough multidirectional stress in their week? Or do you think they need to actually play it as a sport as well? Like, what's the mm. adequate amount of volume? Yeah. We already spoke what's about the, this. What's the dosage? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Well, cool. We can speak about it again. Repetition <laughs> creates. Clearly, we don't listen to our own <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a good question. But I wonder, how, yeah, how mm. do you get them to buy in? Because it's, it's pretty, seems to be pretty clear. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and just saying, go down and kick the soccer ball. like. And I think of... it sets you up for other skills too. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Good. So My second good high. high of the week was... While I was away on, while we were in New Zealand, a couple of patients saw some of my other colleagues in the clinic and it was just really cool to see, uh, I guess, similar messages that I had been repeating to those patients being reiterated and it, I guess, to give some context, these these are more chronic um, injuries or patients that I've been seeing for a while and with, with some of them in particular, it felt as though certain messages had been uh, from my end repeated quite a few mm-hmm. times and maybe it hadn't been absorbed as, as well as I would have hoped. Mm-hmm. So they they saw another colleague of mine while I was away and the same message was reinforced through, you know, their their opinion mm-hmm. or their, their um, assessment of them. And hopefully it's sort of, I guess, um, yeah, better, better reinforced and the, the patient maybe better understands why it's being recommended. And it just made me realize that maybe sometimes there's, there's value in referring patients to either a colleague or another health professional for that same reason. If it feels like you're kind of going around in circles, giving the same advice and it, it might not be mm. sort of taken in as well as you would hope, then maybe it just needs to come from someone else yeah, to, to try and advice. say it again. Um, cause yeah, I just thought that that was really cool to, to see and hear and, and sort of get that, that feedback that that's, there's certainly value in that. Yeah. That's really, really good advice that, and especially, and even us being maybe in the middle part of our career, probably no, still in the early stages, definitely. And yeah, I still do the same thing and, and working with, with Justin, getting his opinion and eyes and it's really valuable having them next door. Mm. And I used to be so embarrassed as a clinician when you're like, oh, I just want to go out and grab someone. Oh, can they come have a look? I just want to confirm them. Now I'm like, hey, this doesn't really fit into any box. I'm just going to go grab my other colleague and have a look. Is that okay? Mm. And I've done that. I've gone out and speak to the doctors. It's really, really good. And yeah. I, I, I seem to think patients value it. But yeah, yeah great, great. And advice. I think I think it's relevant in like that early diagnostic stage, but also, yeah, mm. as I mentioned, like later on when they are a long-standing <laughs> patient and, and maybe what you're saying just doesn't sink in because yeah. you've been seeing them for so long yeah. just for it to come from someone else. What about what we were talking about? Like we went for a run this morning and we were chatting about like this exact topic and I, I do wonder how much... How different the information, the same information is coming from the archetypes of clinicians and we'll mm-hmm. say four archetypes of a young new grad female, a young new grad male, an older f- male and an older female, mm-hmm. like the tone, the stature. I just, I, I think there, I don't know if there's any research on it and it's only just come into my mind then to actually look for some research on that. Yeah. Because we were talking about that, like you, it's just different. And like even, I don't know how you would... I, don't, I want to try and approach it in a nice way. I just don't know. No, 100%. Yeah. When I first graduated, I, the amount of patients that I had, and, and mm. typically it was probably the, the more middle-aged um, group of patients asking me how old I was, mm. was out of control. Like every second patient, I reckon, yeah. would ask me how old I am. I don't get that so much anymore, maybe because I'm finally starting to look a bit older. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't it think was, you've changed was, that much. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's because I wasn't as confident back then as I am now. I don't yeah. know, but it was regular. In, in comparison, regular. I, I never got oh, yeah. that at all. And I'm obviously at, you know, I'm 6, 195 centimetres, 100 kilo. Like, I'm a bigger guy. I don't know if I look older, but... Yeah, I yeah, think I you do. Know. It's interesting. I, yeah, I wonder how... And it, it seems, you know, patients have sex-specific clinicians they want to see as well. Yeah, So definitely. I wonder how the delivery is. But yeah, that, that's an interesting topic. Let's make a note to look for some research on that. Last my one. last my last high <laughs> is that I have started um, running coaching with Woo! Femi. Yeah. So um, I'm getting coached by Lydia and I'm just really excited to Lydia O'Donnell that is. I'm really excited to to learn and just be able to, you know, follow the program that's been set for me and and yeah, try and get some really good runs yeah. for next year. First one, park run. No, park run, 5k under 20 minutes. Yeah. That's the first goal, which is cool. Yeah, Easily I'm achievable. looking forward to that. Yeah, and any lows? No, no lows. Any reflection points? And you can no, not, you, can you say just no, no. threw me on, on the spot for that one. You yeah, didn't you even can say no. You can say no. Reflection points. Yeah, you any... go first and I'll think about it while you talk. All right. Well, I'll start with my highs and lows. 
highs for me this week after coming back from New Zealand, had a lot of time to myself to read without any service on my phone, listened to a lot of audiobooks and a lot of audiobooks on conversation and, and human interaction. And a lot of the, the topics and I guess reoccurring themes were the authors talking about just pausing and also asking direct questions, keeping them simple and keeping them direct. And I've been trying to implement this in the last week and a half and yeah, it's, it's odd. It feel, it's really difficult to do because I like to get out a lot of information and one thing I value, I think, or one thing I think patients value is lots of information, but that's my bias. I think they need that, but perhaps they don't. When you say direct questions, do you mean closed-ended questions? Well, not, not so much, just in the way that I deliver them and, and saying, so for an example, seeing a runner and just probably not a question, but a statement just saying, the reality is you can definitely keep running, but it's going to make your rehab take longer. And then just pausing and stopping and mm. waiting for them to answer. Before, I would say the reality is, you know, it, it'll it probably take a little bit longer, but we can work around it. And then I would pause and then I would add something again because I'm like, I'm trying to try and show them that yeah. we can work around this. But yeah, now I'm just like, cool. this is how it is. And this is what I can do. And the other one is... I've been using the ceiling and floor analogy a lot. And people coming in and severs, I definitely say this quite a lot. I just say, you know, we've probably reached the ceiling with podiatry care at the moment. Soft inner soles, taping, compression socks, good shoes. You understand what's going on, how it relates to load and that kind of thing. You've probably maxed out what I can offer you and how much I can help. Now it's a matter of you have to either continue doing what you love to do, which is fine. You're not going to rupture your Achilles or break the bone or anything like that. However, it's going to be sore and you're going to be sore the next few days. And that's the reality of it. And then just pausing. And then they're like, great. So if it's too sore, we just reduce what we're doing. But otherwise, we're not going to do any more damage. And I'm like, yeah. And it's mm. really, really odd because I'm always trying to add stuff. So Yeah, that's cool. I think not sugarcoating it. They'll probably remember it a whole lot more because yeah. you already know that they that most pe- people only remember or retain 13% or whatever yeah. that number is. And just, yeah, same. But that. I think it makes it a lot easier to remember when you're not just like talking and talking and talking. I know that I do that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> and it, it's so <laughs> hard cool. to do and just pausing. I like and it. the other one I've been doing, like when they sit down, I just let them speak. And then I just pause and my body, and if you obviously like, can't see this audio, I'm just like, oh my God, someone needs to speak. And it's been like <laughs> a half a second. And yeah, it's really hard. And it just makes me think of all the people I've cut off or I've beat around the book. And then they haven't taken what I'm trying to say because I've kind of said this. And then I'm like, oh yeah, it's, you know, the protocol of six weeks for this bone stress injury. But if we do this and that, we could probably get five and a half. And if we do this and you eat well and sleep. But, but now I'm just, it's six weeks. This is what you need to do. And this is the reality of, of what we're dealing with here. And they seem to take... And just, I guess that comes with as you grow as a clinician. I think it I demonstrates a lot more confidence too. Yeah. 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 And actually, and that's what I was saying. We're talking about on the run this morning. It's all... Yeah. yeah with Justin and I were talking about this, this confidence that you get possibly as you get become more of a clinician where you see it enough times and get enough wins on the board. And I wasn't aware of this. This is... Um, Justin explaining it to me and I was like wow I've never really thought about it like that and then when you observe other clinicians that are, are good clinicians you tend to see that a little bit as well mm. yeah so that was was my high lows were a couple of posts that I've saw seen sorry people calling out younger clinicians for not having the skills and calling out universities for being crappy and not teaching them and things and it's just really some of these posts are so polarizing. Like, if you're not doing this, it's unethical. You're like, it's basically saying you're an idiot if you're not doing this without offering any, without offering any advice or education, and just making people feel bad for God knows what reason. Like, you can definitely say that in a better way. Perhaps, you know, using an example and then saying, "This is what I would do," or if you're not confident, reach out. But it's really, I could just imagine that would be quite difficult to read that as a student because you just feel horrible and mm. you don't get as many wins on the board just because you don't see that many patients or you haven't seen that many patients. So, yeah, that was a low for me. I felt really upset. It mm. really made me, and it makes me realise how much I, I do love educating and talking with the students. I know lots of students listen to this and I know that they would, would say that I'm 
passionate in that area. And I was like, I just wanted to get on there and reply and write this big paragraph, but I just left it. And I was just like, you know, when you write a letter and then burn it, it's like just annoying. You know? mm. I think I can see both sides though, because then, because mm. otherwise, <laughs> you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, students will graduate and feel like they know everything when maybe they don't know as much as they should. And mm. that's some students in particular that, that I might be thinking of that I've seen um, across the years who, who just have this almost um, unhealthy amount of confidence as a student. Mm. And I think that that can be dangerous in yeah. some ways. Yeah, I agree. So I think I that there's, there's a, a need for some um, sort of just, you know, pumping down their tires in some cases. Yeah, in, in a in a good way. Like if you do something wrong, say, hey, did you just do that? That is unethical. Are you an idiot? Like how does that make you feel? No, that's it, definitely not the way to do it. Yeah, and that's what this What do you think like. is a better way to do it? A better way is, and it's hard, but, but a better way than I have found is to, to have a little bit of dialogue to see why they did it. Mm. So like, what you know, what was your clinical reasoning for doing that? And really trying to pre-frame it to say, this is an open environment. Yeah. And I always tell them, and I don't know if other people are like this, but I always tell people that I'm discussing with when I've got it wrong, so they feel a little bit more open because it can come across as we mm. always get it right. And we, I know that we're really open that we get it wrong a lot. Mm. Sounds yeah, I think that's good. I think <laughs> yeah. asking asking a, a student their clinical reasoning and, and maybe just getting them to realise that what they have done isn't well, the right just, there's, thing there's a, or, oh, or there might be a different way to, to yeah, go about it. There's possibly a better way. So yeah. saying where you're wrong, saying that you've got it wrong before, just saying, great, how did, how did you get to that outcome? Cool. And do you feel like that was the right thing or do you feel like you didn't really know or you just did it hoping for the best and then seeing what their answer is and saying, great, this is how I've done it. And it doesn't always mean it's the right way. And then you would expect students to get lots of different people's advice and put their own together, I would mm. expect. But Yeah, I like that. I think and, that's good. Yeah. Now, a couple of topics that we wanted to, that I wanted to ask your opinion on. People thinking osteoarthritis and pathology can limit them from what, they're, what they want to do forever. So saying, you know, I can't, I can't run that 10K, I've got an ELA. Or I can't, go and play water polo anymore. I'm in my 40s and I've got shoulder bursitis. I can see the two sides where there may be more of a ceiling or the ceiling may be lower compared to they didn't have it, possibly. But those terms in passing, and I've heard this on a couple of podcasts, that can make people then relate that to themselves and then really limit them when it's probably not the case. What mm -hmm. do you think? Do you, so are you asking like, Do you think there's a, there is a lower ceiling for people with these injuries or pathologies? Like if I have knee OA... Does it is there a, a lower ceiling compared to if I didn't to what I want to do or how much f further I can run or something? I guess so. I guess it's a, a factor in why they may be experiencing pain or the symptoms that they're experiencing. But if you did, didn't have pain, is your ceiling lower? Hard question. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that you can make predictions of the future though i don't think that you can mm -hmm. say that you'll never run 10 kilometers in mm -hmm. in the future because how do you how do you yeah. know that I agree, I agree with yeah i agree with you i do think that pathology is a factor in why people may experience pain or, or symptoms of some oh, yeah, sort definitely, definitely and therefore i guess it will be a or I guess it could be a, a limiter for them mm. achieving their goals or they might need to work a little bit harder or put some different mm. strategies in place to minimise the risk of it becoming a problem. Yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I just want to... Yeah. I, I just hear these little passing comments and I know people are just making them... They just say mm. it without even thinking of it. I don't know why my antennas seem to stick up for that kind of thing. Like, oh, I can't do that race. My, I've got knee away or... I, just uh, that language. Mm. Mm. I think language that ble important. like that's that's like a it's so um, common to hear that in society too. Mm. Like it's a social construct, really, yeah. and then it just sort of bleeds or through or... con um, conversations in that I guess that demographic of people that are experiencing those problems. So yeah. one person hears it, and then it's a domino effect. The next person hears it. The next person hears it. The next person hears it. So. Mm. I think us offering our best advice or just questioning why they think that they know the the, the, the future future yeah. is the only way that that's going to change. change. The other one, footwear and MTSS. 
heard this a couple of times, we can be pretty confident to say that MTSS or medial tibial stress syndrome and simply, you know, an imbalance with bone turnover, you know, the bone's not able to get stronger in comparison to how much load it's getting. Shoes don't do anything but change somewhat the load going through there. It doesn't make the bone stronger. Isn't a, like a higher navicular <clears throat> drop a risk factor or an uh, overpronation or something like that, a risk factor for MTSS? Navicular drop and drift. Actually, no, I think it's only the navicular drop is. Pron- which is, is, which is, is, pro- is, well, pronation is different. Like okay. Pronation, pronation yeah. in the terms is Taylor, um, Taylor inversion, plantar flexion and something else. I so then if use. that's true, then wouldn't footwear have some role? Yeah, I guess it, it depends on what footwear does. If it does it reduce the rate of pronation? Does it reduce the end range of the pronatory moment you can get to? Well, think about someone wearing a Nike Vaporfly compared to wearing a Brooks Ghost. Mm. I think that could mm. be different. Mm. I, it's definitely a factor, but I hear a lot of people jump to like they've, ch- they've either they've changed their shoes or have you pl- you know I've got shin splints, I've got MTSS, and people that. When one of their first or couple of responses, have you played around with shoes, wear a more supportive shoe? And it's like, that can be good, but that's like seventh or eighth down the list. But it's easy. Would you not agree? I know that when I've had shin pain, the yeah. first thing that I've easily tried is just wearing a, a more yeah, you're right. stable I guess it, foot, footwear. Foot, footwear. Yeah, in combination with other things. Yeah. But that, I don't, like, that shouldn't be first line, I don't think. But I guess you're saying if it's easy... Yeah, I mean, reducing someone's load, obviously, is going to be the first thing that you're going to do. And getting them stronger and seeing what other factors... But strength doesn't happen as quickly as changing someone's shoes would, and especially Mm. if they've got uh, shoes already sitting at home that they could opt between. Yeah, I guess so. I would would like to, and you've definitely made me think about that one, I would like to hear people like, oh, great, are you tracking your load? What strength training are you doing? How much are you eating? Like those are the questions I would like to hear people talk about. But I guess that's our bias because we try to learn mm. a lot about this topic. Anyway, last one: hypermobility and connective tissue disorders. And Mo is a, an awesome weapon researcher from the, the University of Newcastle that's got his own PhD on this. But he was talking about. <coughs> sorry, I was thinking about the last couple of weeks, and I've seen some hypermobile people and <clears throat> typically I wouldn't ask or think of anything rheumatological or connective tissue, tissue disorders or anything else in the body but I've started to ask some other questions like do you get any back pain do you get any joint pain you know do you, do you feel tired overall not to say that I'm screening for it are you talking about in kids just in anyone okay <clears throat> mostly adults mm-hmm. and more the, this the archetype I'm thinking of is more of an adolescent, but adults as well. And just seeing um, again, I'm not going to diagnose it or say anything like that. But if there's a couple of things, and I know there is a criteria, there's 14 for the rheumatoid arthritis thing. And I was thinking to myself, and I've sent one person to the to a GP to to be screened just because I I swear that I and we thought we'd I saw, saw some rheumatoid nodules that had pain in their smaller jo- joints and skin change and hypermobile and then their windswept deformity, all these foot changes that are really common with rheumatoid arthritis. And it just got me thinking, I wonder if that's something that I can think of when I see someone that's hypermobile. Do you ever think of that? Think of, wait, what's the question? Like is the hypermobility related or associated with any other systemic disease? I don't think that that's our role to make that call. I think it's our role to identify it. Yeah, I yeah, I that's what I was kind of saying. Like I'm not telling them that or screening for that, but I'm just asking a couple of other questions. Yeah, like, like those you, red flag type of yeah, questions. Yeah, do you get any joint pain? Do you get any back pain? You know, do you feel fatigued? Like, and again, if they say yes to all those questions, I'm not gonna say, hey, I think you've got this. this I think you've got this disease. What's going it gonna doctor. change though? It'll change a lot. If It'll they've drastic- got hypermobility. No, no, no. So if someone's coming in with hypermobility. Right, 
I'm asking other questions around to rule, not to rule in or out, but to maybe pique my interest to see. And I'm thinking, imagine a funnel. If they answer yes to all these questions, like I'm a little bit more suspicious that there could be something else going. And I might say, have you ever had a blood test from your GP? So are you talking about ruling out inflammatory disorders? Any kind of systemic disease, um, whether it be rheumatological, whether it be... Um, mm. Oh, what's the other one? What is the other brand? Like connective tissue disorders. What does that fit into? Rheumatological? Mm, no, mm. connective tissue would yeah. be more. And I got that from reading that physio magazine. Like mm. um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, all those disorders have hypermobility as a really prominent factor. And again, not to say that it's what 0.1% and it might be out of all the 500 patients I see with hypermobility, one might have something. But I just thought of that could be something that I could maybe get better at. What do you think? I'm obviously not diagnosing it. And I'm, I'm, yeah. you're looking at me like you're thinking, thinking no, that yeah. I'm going, hey, you've got this going on because your foot's floppy. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just thinking what other systemic red or flags that are popping out to me that I could p- possibly help this patient. Yeah. I'm just thinking uh, big inflammatory questions for, for me that I ask is, mm. is obviously night pain and mm. pain that is worse sort of first thing in the morning but doesn't necessarily calm down as as quickly as something like Mm -hmm. osteoarthritis might and but then the other thing that i was thinking of is if someone has a hypermobility disorder yep i don't i don't know i don't know what i was thinking you're just thinking they could just be hypermobile they could yeah yeah like do you want to send them through the whole rigmarole of tests and I don't know rheumat- <laughs> like rheumat- I guess yeah. I guess you do if it's related to their pain and you symptoms can, yeah you can hear me speaking can't you I can <laughs> I, I, I'm still not entirely sure of your question so <laughs> if if someone comes into the clinic and I, yeah if someone comes in and their foot is floppy yes I'm not sending them for rheumatological screening I'm not saying to the doctor, this person needs blood tests. I'm not saying that to the patient. What I'm saying is if I identify someone based off the bait and score, they are hypermobile, Yeah. that might precede me to ask more questions, delve a little bit more deeper into the possibility that they may have something going on compared to if they don't have a flexible foot, a really hypermobile foot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't ask think... those questions because your ones are good. So they would be, do you have any night pain or do you have any pain? Because typically with musculoskeletal ones, they don't once they're off it. But saying, you know, do you have any pain in the morning that typically tends to stay pretty stable once it starts. Is that right? It It's so morning pain that doesn't necessarily improve as, mm. as quickly <clears> as <throat> getting up and moving around like something like Neo I would. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. And then I ask you around back pain. And yeah, but, but everyone has back pain. Yeah, uh, it's back pain. Any other joint pain? So multi-site yes. pain is one. Any mm. others that you can think of? And any changes in their um, smaller joints yeah. for rheumatoid arthritis? And yeah, and like heat, I guess, if it feels like Ooh. hot. Yeah, yeah, and fatigue. If is they've had, one. the other one would be like if they've had any recent, this isn't necessarily um, like a systemic disease, but if they've had a recent illness or Ooh. some sort of virus that could be yeah. sort of localizing potentially to a joint, in, like an infected joint. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I don't know what you were, you were thinking I'm just taking the yeah, blood. Yeah, I was really I'm going, confused. hey, I think you've got this. I'm going to start <laughs> taking your blood and send it to the doctor. But I, yeah, did have, and it just got me thinking about that during the week. And yeah, I nice. thought that's something that I could get better at mm-hmm. to have that in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Cool. Any other parting words for our lovely listeners? That's it. I think that's any, it. Any advice? Well, you asked me this last time and I said something good. Yeah, you did say something good. You said any a couple advice? of good ones today. Any advice? You've been on fire. Mm. Um, I reckon mm. start your Monday with oh, a that good right. That was right. eight, eight to nine right. hours of sleep. If you need to miss training in the morning, do it. Get get Ooh. a good night's sleep yeah, in the morning uh, for the night so that you wake up feeling, for your Monday, feeling super fresh. Listen to a good playlist, your favorite playlist on the way to work and then just start it with like a really good energy. Ooh, okay. And this is good because I'm going to say the opposite. What? I'm going to say do some zone one and zone two, low, low really low intensity where you I barely break. if you need to miss training, then do so. Not no, to miss I'm, it. I'm saying do training because that's great for it switches you on. And then also don't listen to your favorite playlist. 
doesn't have to be this podcast. Just listen to a clinical podcast. Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rip on Barack and my audio book. That's the best book I've ever listened to. Like, has been listening to this audio book on repeat for the last That's two so years. That's freaking good. <laughs> I, love, if I love you, Barack. <laughs> He's the best. But I'm saying put on something clinical and just really listen to what they're saying. I think it gets you in that mood. So you walk in, 9 o'clock, they sit down. Don't say anything. Just pause. You know, the reality is... <laughs> And then just to say whatever the reality is. But yeah, a couple of pauses and definitely train. So good advice. Mm. Opposite advice. I said, if you if you need to sacrifice training for sleep, do so. No, if you, you can sleep it, and train, right. happy days. You're yeah. gonna, your week's going to be even better. <laughs> we'll be good. All right, lovely listeners. Enjoy and we'll talk to you all next week. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of your favorite podcast, The Sports Medicine Project. Now, we have a very special guest. I mean, we always have a special guest, but we've got Sam Turner here. Now, to quickly plug his incredible Instagram page, That Football Podiatrist, and you guessed probably what we're going to be talking about. A lot of things podiatry, but specifically talking about kind of football boots, their characteristics, how they can be used therapeutically. And we were just talking off air about the divide between we know so much about running shoes could sit down and talk about it for hours when it comes to football boots we probably don't know as much as i don't think as many practitioners know as much as what we can but i'll let him introduce himself sam thanks for coming on mate how you going oh, good thanks blake thanks for having me on how's it up in newy mate, it's pretty pretty nice it's a saturday we're recording this it's a bloody nice day outside but i don't care what the weather looks like because we're talking podiatry so i'd rather be doing this nah <laughs> fair enough mate fair enough um, yeah, so, where about to you? You're you're down south. Yeah, so I'm based in North Melbourne, in just a kilometre out of the CBD, um, in a nice little um, sports um, physio clinic. Um, so I'm the sole podiatrist here, but I'm surrounded by seven pretty fantastic physios who give me a pretty good rap and a bit of support mm-hmm. when I need it. Yeah, very nice. And well, I mean, we're, we're talking off air, but for the listeners, what's been kind of your story in transition because you're a bit of an outsider yeah. to the listeners you haven't been a podiatrist you didn't you know go to bed at night when you were two years old dreaming of becoming a podiatrist <laughs> no that didn't come until a bit later so my background is i'm a pno so yeah um trained prosthetist and orthotist and that was probably about 10 years ago um which took me over to well, up into newcastle um as well as up into sydney for my first gig um, having a look at more so that spinal orthotic component, so making custom spinal jackets and working in a pretty acute spinal setting. So completely different to yep. feet and ankles and lower limb <laughs> parts. Yep. Not with that bit. Um, but I went over to New Zealand for an opportunity. I needed a bit of a change from Melbourne, and I was young, and you can have a bit of fun overseas. And I ended up in um, a place called Hamilton in New Zealand. And I was working with an orthotics company there, um, again, doing spinal components, but I was given the task of helping to run a high-risk foot clinic and a rheumatoid clinic and started being introduced to um, the local pods there, um, which was pretty amazing. So a lot of wound care, but having a look at how the podiatric aspect works with it and how we tie in. And from that, I um, got to meet a bloke called Andrew Jones, who's one of the premier um, MSK or sports pods over in the Waikato. So he does a lot with the Institute there. Yeah. And we, and we, yeah. So um, every, like every chance I would get, I would be over at his practice or up into his workshop and mm. just bugging him to no end about, okay, why do you do this? What do you mean about that? Aren't orthotics supposed to be a centimetre thick and go into a pair of doctor comforts? Hmm. that type of style like why why are you using polypropylene or like okay yeah. like why are you using hard shells wouldn't an eva be better so that traditional pod versus yeah. um orthotist divide but i started finding okay i'm enjoying this space and jumping into it so i went back and studied at the tender age of 25 and Mm. Um, which was a bit of an interesting one, but it was probably one of the best things 
Yeah. I did. So went back, um, studied, got my first gig up in Kilmore and Wellen, so out bush. So where well, you learn absolutely everything about anything. So you're doing nail surgeries, orthotics, sporting yeah. injuries, general care. Um, then the opportunity came to work at Footwork. So the big lab and to um, draw on some of my experiences as an orthotist, but to bring it into a pod setting. So I was in charge of um, EVA manufacture for two years, then worked my way up and did a lot with production and post-production. Yeah. So I got to see every bit from design to finishing. Yeah, that's awesome. You, you yeah. To, definitely. Yeah. So it was probably one of the biggest and hardest learning experiences I've ever had. Like the team there are phenomenal and they produce a fantastic product. Yeah. But you do need excellence, and like it was, yeah, an amazing experience. And what I've taken from there is what I've started to bring back into clinic and having a look at what I can do, not only in a sporting environment, but starting to fix up and have a look at the way I prescribe. Yeah. But during that time, I was lucky enough to um, find a little role here in North Melbourne. I was just living around the corner. And they said, do you need a podiatrist? And I went, okay, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, and that was four, four years ago in September. And yeah, it's grown from there. And during that time, uh, one of the physios was working at Western United for the initial season. And he asked, we need a pod. What do you think about it? And I went, yeah, sure. Like, I've always wanted to work in this space. And from there, I went, I actually don't know a lot about football. I don't know a lot about soccer. I played Aussie rules as a kid. Mm. But um, this little area is a gap in my knowledge. Yeah. If I'm going to be working with professionals, um, I need to know everything there is to know about it, if not more. And part of that is learning about football boots. Yeah. That's probably where I'm at the moment or learning about that football aspect and it's probably an area that over the past 10 years has grown a lot of traction mm. but the literature behind it is if you do a quick look hasn't necessarily been there but always been sporadic yeah yeah so that's where i am at the moment looking at yeah. football boots dealing with western united um unfortunately it's a bit of a rough season after winning the the, the championship last year which was yeah. phenomenal yeah. But, um, yeah, but it brought me into, like, local sporting clubs or NPL um, one clubs down here, and but even into some of more of our um, Aussie rules teams. Like, it's, we're finding that the importance of having the right boot is quite, in, well, it's important through there. It's part of the tour of the trade, just like runners for, running shoes for runners. Yeah, and that's what we're saying, like, you know, offline, it's, so many people, the characteristics of running shoes, we, we just know so much about them, so, so much. And we know therapeutically, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today, of like rocket shoes for sagittal plane deformities and cushion shoes and what things we want. But when it comes to football boots, and we all deal with football boots, I think, as podiatrists, um, obviously not as much as probably runners or, or shoes in the general walker, but having a good understanding of the characteristics and what shoes kind of sit where is just going to make you a better practitioner, but for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a big thing. Like, um, like Aussie rules and soccer um, are two of the fastest growing sports in the country. And I think rug, um, rugby league, well, I have to distinguish rugby league and rugby union for everything, but that's still having the growth. Like, we're seeing arc footballers to semi elite um, players through there. And there's over, really, over a million people who are playing some form of ball sport that involves their feet. Yeah. So that's that's huge. Yeah, and getting the, the boots right and the, the orthotics is it's gonna be interesting to see how how far we get. So I wanted to start the, the first question, which is a pretty broad question, and I think I might know the answer, but I'm inter really interested to hear your take of you know, football boots, do they have they have categories and we're comparing them to running shoes of like cushion stability and neutral, or is it more sports specific, or how can we generally think of them like an umbrella? kind of concept so there's a couple of ways to think about it um obviously the first part is having a look at soul plate technology so what we mean by that is having a look at whether or not it's used for a soft ground so your boggier slipperier type of pitch yeah. that you would traditionally use a set of metals 
than a firm ground type sole pattern. So what I mean by that, I've got a couple of boots, it's similar to that. So it's more your molded type of that's, design. That's the soft, softer, wet, wetter tracks. Yeah, so what we generally see with most pitches here in Australia is more your firm ground. So, but your soft ground is where you have your metal stud at the back. So generally yeah. back two, or maybe one here, one here, and one here. Yep. to give you a, a lot more tractional stability in that wet, boggier type ground. But the most common one is probably more of a firm ground. So like your traditional pitch that we'd see, that's so got a bit more um, hardness to it. Um, again, here in Australia, we don't generally get the wet, boggy, mm. heavy type pitch. It's more of a dry component. And that's where we use the firm ground. Part that generally looks something like your yeah, tempo. Okay. Is that so? When the difference with that is, it's the like it doesn't have the metal. It's the the. T are you talking about the, the tips or the actual <laughs> sole itself? Um. So more so the tips. So that actual stud type okay. pattern. Yeah. So you can have some more wet, firm, well, soft ground ones in your Asics range, like here with like your testimonials, which are pretty long and pretty deep. Yeah. yeah. But again, I'd probably classify that as a more of a firm ground type of stud yep. than anything else. But then you'll move on to like your artificial grounds. So like your synthetic or your hybrid type of components. I wish I had one here, but it's generally where you would, sorry. Uh, yeah, with the hybrid grounds, what's the difference with studs there, like there? So you'd be normally having a look at um, studs that are generally a lot more shorter oh, and okay. generally more your conical. So similar to like your um, ultimate here. Yeah, so a lot more yeah. rounded type of um, stud pattern. Um, Asics um, do a good one. Nike do a fantastic artificial or hybrid one where your studs are a lot more close together um, and a lot more shorter. So really they can stand up to the rigors of an artificial ground. So as opposed to say a firm ground through yeah. three here. Um, the big part with that is obviously working on that artificial ground, you get a lot more friction from that unnatural, that synthetic grass mm -hmm. that comes through and that can start to wear down your um, studs. So what they do is increase the surface area, go a bit sh shallower um, mm -hmm. to give you a bit more life and longevity into there. So Yeah. So wide, so, so for the artificial wider, shorter studs are typically a yeah. bit more durable and last a bit longer and less. Yeah. So what we'll find in that is a lot of junior pitches are synthetic and a lot of these junior players will be coming through. So I'm going off on a tangent here. Oh, no, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be wearing, um, say, a firm ground stud on a synthetic pitch yeah. and they're using it as their sole boot for training and game. And parents will complain, why aren't they holding up to it? Or they might be getting um, fat pad contusions up the heel or forefoot components because the studs are just wearing down because that huge friction and mm -hmm. it's starting to change where the studs are. So instead of saying, okay, when not playing on grass, um, like a natural turf, um, we're more so going to be playing on a synthetic. That's probably a big thing. So that's probably the first part is having a look at what your stud or your sole, what we call a sole plate. So yeah. that, this yeah, section that here. Bottom. Yeah, that plant is so yeah. So there's a couple other subcategories, which are like hard ground, which are more so played on gravel. Um, but we were seeing a lot more of that up in Japan or even on to the um, east coast of Tassie. They've got those old gravel hmm. type surfaces, um, which is a different kettle of fish. They're just new on the market, but not a lot. Um, so in Australia yep. with that. But then, so once you've established what sole plate someone's going to use, you're then going to get into like your next parts which are generally a speed boot which is like your nike mercurial yeah which is yeah, a lot light yeah a lot lighter a, a lot more flex into it um that generally doesn't have a lot of structure to that boot so these are generally for your faster speedier yeah. type of players they're generally a striker or a winger um so you want a good feeling between your foot and the boot um, because they do go a bit lighter and a bit more um, deconstructed in some parts, you do um, forfeit a bit of your equipment or your bit of um, your comfort features 
yeah. that you would normally see. So yeah, that little one is a speed silo. So your mercurials, a big one in that space, or your New Balance Furon is another one that you might see. Yeah. So these are probably the most, they're probably the most common one I would see. see yeah. So, yeah. They're a lot lighter. Um, all, all your favourite players wear something similar to this. Like with the Ronaldo has just released his um, CR7 variety of that, and they look absolutely beautiful. Oh, good. Blue and white, blue and white motif, and like of course they come down with your lesser model, but like you have a junior academy yeah. type of model into there. But probably that's a big one into your speed. The next one is what we call maybe a a touch boot or a control boot. So often that's characterised by the yeah, addition to like ribbing or um, uh, yeah. texture onto your top. So you can see here, this is an Adidas Predator, um, how it's got that component into here. So it gives you a little bit more grip onto the ball, um, a little bit more control. So often we'll see this with like a midfielder, um, say who wants to do a little bit more dribbling, wants to have a little bit more contact with the ball. Sometimes they'll come with a little bit of an instep pad uh, or a little bit more structure into mm. this area. Um, I'll often see these. That, that's so, got more structure to it. Yeah. Like, so, so I'm like thinking like therapeutically and pathology wise, like, you know, people with midfoot injuries, navicular issues, that kind of thing. Like, do they tend to work a little bit better because they're more? I, yeah, that's the big thing. So like, obviously we're working through with a lot more stiffness through that midsole. Mm. And still got that forward bend onto what the MTP Js are, but you're not going to be rolling, yeah, compared to rotating like that, yeah. So when you're working with something like your speed um, silo, you're going to have a lot more movement potentially, so a lot more force, and especially when you're coming through like a big one is fifth metatarsal type injuries, yeah. you'll often find that rolling into this, loading up laterally. Yeah, your foot is going to start progressing past that um, past that side of the boot and can actually really load up that lateral column. Yeah. Whereas into this one, you've got a lot more structure. You've got probably a little bit more in terms of your lockdown. Um, it conforms across the boot. And you've also got added, a lot. Added, added predator, is it? That yeah, one? so that's the added predator. This is um, two seasons ago. Yeah. Version, they've just released a couple with the World Cup. Yeah. Um, and they've brought out a couple of um, replica ones from um, the 1994 one, as well as the um, oh. the the original one for David Beckham is out in gold. So the old um, the old um, padded tongue over the top. It's the um, elastic oh, cool. Yeah. So going completely old school, but they're a limited edition and they're retailing for about 550 bucks. Yeah. So more so more so for your collectors. Yeah. Than yeah. anything else. Do you, um, so, do you find like with recommending and, you know, for different surfaces and, and different tracks and I guess the, the stud physiology, do, do you send people to the places where they can get them with these recommendations? And do you also find that people typically have had the wrong kind of um, the wrong out of soul for the, the track that they're going to be on? So, yeah, that's probably a big thing that we've had a look at. Um, in sending people to places, unfortunately, there's not a lot of specialty football yeah. boot stores. Um, am I allowed to mention brands? Or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if you send someone to, like, your local Rebel store, like, yeah. they're going to rock up and they say, I've seen this boot. I want this boot, such and such. Where's this boot? It's a firm ground, but I don't care. I just want to try it on. Sort of fits, but that's what I want it to do. Um, so I'll find in doing that, it's a bit hard for someone to go to a shop and say, I want to try this on. And the other thing is there's generally not any stock anymore. Yeah. Like, um, but we're lucky here in Australia, um, down in Melbourne, we've got two fantastic stores. Yeah. Um, one's ultra football, um, which is a specialty football boot, um, store. They get you to try on the boot. You can have a kick, you can have a run around and you can find out what works for you. The other one's SPT football. And they specialise in this. As to going through, I want you to have a look at this, this, and this. Um, it's more probably a hard part in terms of education because, again, these places want to sell football boots. Yeah. 
yeah. and they want to put someone into a boot that the player will want rather than say, as a podiatrist, I recommend you go into a tempo yeah. as opposed to your mercurial. Yeah. Um, and that's probably the hard part. And that's what I've been trying to work with. Um, Ultra is saying, okay, let's set up this referral pathway similar to like your specialty running shoe store. Yeah. Like I've, I've got this person who's got plenty of heel pain. They're a low gear um, propulsion. Um, and they're also getting some FHL type issues. This is what I want to have a look at. Let's consider this, this, and this. And generally they go to the store, they try, try it on. They have a couple of options and they might not necessarily go into a Saucony that you've put a, you put through or like if you're having a look at the Kinvara as opposed to say, okay, let's get you into a 1080, like two different types of things. That's probably the hard part at the moment that you can't really say, I want you to try this one, this one, this one and go like, oh yeah, like you're in a pair of tempos, but you might be needing a New Balance 442, which is a, again, a more comfort type boot, which this is. Yep. And so same type of design, it's still leather, it's still got the rounded start, it's still got nice lacing, it's a little bit wider, but unfortunately you've got these big, broad pancake type feet that we need to put an orthotic in um, and you're just waterfalling over the edge. Mm. So let's get you into a 442. Um, so same type of design, but we can start fitting in a device or we can fit in a four foot various uh, valgus wedge yeah. Um, so yeah. So short answer to that. Um, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Um, but again, what I've got people trying to do is build up a really good relationship with these stores that sell yeah. football boots and say, so, okay, what are we having a look at? Um, this is what I'd like to have a look at and working on a bit of education with the yeah. sales, yeah. sales staff. And I'm mind? lucky that. Sorry, what what do you find the like? How do people go ordering online? Like, is that ever an option for parents and things? I'm, I'm thinking, and the case in my head is like um, kids with severs and they've got football boots, and we're trying to get the right football boot, but they can't find the right yeah. size and type. Yeah. Like, is ordering online an option? Yeah. In this case, yeah. So, yeah. So, like everything, um, it's always fraught with danger in some of those parts mm-hmm. where, like, if you do order it it's a bit hard to gauge how someone's going to behave, but there's generally a pretty good um, rule of thumb. Like we go for not your most aggressive type of boot. So you wouldn't say with someone with severs, you probably wouldn't put them into something that's really aggressive, not a lot of cushion through the back. You might be worthwhile going into say more of your comfort style yeah. boot, which has got like, you can heat it, you can push it through. Um, it's a little bit more cushioned through there. It's got a bit of extra depth yeah. into that space. And again, like the same parts when, like, I don't know about you, when you're referring to someone for shoes, you want them to fit these features. I want adequate room in the toe box. So something like a New Balance 860 mm. is something. I want something with appropriate lockdown. So yeah. I want something with laces. I want something that's not um, too rigid onto that heel counter. So something like that, where I'm having to push in, might just be digging into that. And I'll say, let's go for this. Yeah. And you can generally get a markdown version for generally 90 bucks yeah. because yeah. the design hasn't changed too much. So yeah, right. That, so I'd rather someone try them on, but if it's not the case, it's about, okay, these are my go-tos. Nike, like, I want you to have a look at this, this, and this. Yeah. And yeah, go for so. That. What um what do you find for people with just wide feet? Like we're talking just wide forefoot, flexible forefoot, lots of splaying. Like what's what do you do for them? What do you recommend? Like we have patients all the time, and Justin was saying he had someone yesterday, and it, it's just hard to know what's going to be best fitting for them because they've tried everything else and it's too much. Let alone, and this is without fitting your device in there, just having it standard. So these are the these are the big things. Um, was it Katrine? A clone Krieger, um, who works a lot with us, had a look at in terms of comfort for people inside boots and what they found over a 90 minute match simulation with boots in perceived comfort was that the difference was almost negligible in terms yeah. of that period of time. So, like in a pair of runners, we might be 
walking around in them. We might go for a jog. We might wear them for coffee. And we're in them as a long-term thing. We might be in them for eight hours. Whereas in a football context, we might only be in them for 30 minutes or 60 minutes or 90 minutes over a full game. And you can potentially get away with something a little bit tighter. Mm -hmm. And that's the big part with most of these players. They want to have that feeling of tightness or snugness so they can get adequate touch. Yeah. But there's just some where you go, you're not getting your foot in there. Like mm -hmm. this is causing issues. Your toes are yeah. like that. Yeah. And you're getting this corn that's just not going away or you're getting this IM bursitis that's just flaring up. Yeah. Um, but the, you can have a look at options. New Balance are offering a wide fit. Yeah. So their new Premier boots in the Furon version 7 comes in a wide fit. Same with the, the Takala. Takala, um, yeah. yep. And uh, as well as the 442s. Like they do come in that wider fit. Um, other things that I've started to do is looking into boot stretches. Mm. Like, unfortunately, I've had to take, if you can't beat them, join them yep. type of approach. So getting someone on an old-fashioned public boot stretcher yeah. and, and then getting the player to dunk their foot in um, hot water with the boot on to help it to stretch. So in terms of like a leather boot, they'll put their, they'll put their foot in and they'll um, soak it in hot water so the boot will start to mould and stretch around their foot. Wow. Can we, can we recommend that? Or you boot makers are doing this? But, the, the pe people have been doing this and this has been a common practice for years to make football boots fit better. Huh. I've even got I've even got blokes who will buy something really tight and like maybe a size too small and they'll get a teammate with bigger feet to yeah. try it on and run around in that for a session to help stretch the boot out. Yeah. And you go, but the thing is, it works a little bit and might only work for a half an hour. But say when you come to like a synthetic, putting it with hot water, it's not necessarily going to stretch that rapidly because mm. of the makeup. But then with the leather boot, um, what people won't notice is that it's actually a hide. So yeah. like if you've ever worn football boots on a really wet, boggy ground, you take them off and you don't wear them for a week, all that leather starts shrinking and mm. Like it, it actually becomes tighter and more rigid than what it was doing before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. That I've, just, never, I've never heard of that. So, like, can I wonder if, like, if someone was struggling with, I'm thinking, trying to relate all, always back to a case, like, if someone was struggling with a little bit of tightness, could they do that? Could you recommend they, do they, yeah. so is it, let me get this right. I hope I've got it right. As in, yeah. bucket or whatever it is of lukewarm water, foot into the football yeah. boot and then putting it in there for how long so they'll soak it for maybe five ten minutes um yeah. i don't recommend it because again it's for a short-term fix what you're yeah. better off doing like like you've got little things say like a bunion yeah. like you've got little contraptions that look like more akin onto a farm <laughs> like you, like it looks a bit vicious but like you can spot stretch areas or if you've got someone yeah. like with a pretty nasty um elevated second toe that you start to get like that pressure on.